Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return again to Numbers chapter 23, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we may more properly understand the symbolism and the example that is being presented before us within this chapter. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we look upon these chapters and this example that is being presented before us, we see our great need of wisdom that can only come from you. We ask, Father, for your direction, for your guidance, and for your blessing. We can do nothing without you. Direct us today. May your spirit be upon us. We ask also that your angels attend us so that all that is done today in our conversation and in this study is done according to your character and according to your direction. I pray for your blessing, Father, upon this presentation, upon the live presentation and that which will go out upon the internet. Help us now be with us so that that which is done may be according to your will so that our characters may become more like yours. For this, Father, we ask, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Now, we are dealing in this situation with Balaam and Balak. Balaam is a prophet that has apostatized. Balak is the king of Moab. Both are symbols that are relevant for this time. Yet we have to identify what these symbols are and how we can apply them to the example that is now before us. Now in Numbers 23:13. And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee, with me unto another place, from, which, from whence thou mayest see them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them, and shalt not see them at all, and curse me them from thence. Now in the Hebrew, why is he taking him to another place? What, what kind of a word is used in this? that would help us to understand another place. Well, the, Hin the Hebrew here uh, just says um, um, acre. So it probably means hinder, generally next, other. So it kind of has um, a bit of, you know, it's not a really clear definition. Um, so, just, so I think the idea is that it's actually a hindered place. Um, okay. The backside. Yeah, that's usually what it would mean. So we're going to go, but they are going to another place. So the hinder place, a comb, spot, locality. Um, And okay. And he brought him into the field of Zophim to the top of Pisgah and built seven altars and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. So what are we seeing when, when they're talking about the field of Zophim? What, what does this mean? 
Is it just a proper name? Is this a descriptive? What what are we seeing? Well, it's the field of the watchers. Um, <laughs> Spot on the on or near the top of Pisgah. Um, so it's probably refers more to like this is a um, a viewing point on the top of Pisgah. Okay. So it's just a prominence, and um, so it's this area in which you can you can look from Pisgah, right? So that's the way that I would take it. Okay. So. The field of Zophim, the field of the watchers, those that observe, is the way I always take a watcher. Yeah, but I think here that, yeah, I mean, it is observer, watcher. Um, but this is a prominence then from which something can be viewed. I think okay. Here. So here again, the lookout. Like you know, I think of a place like when I was in Silver Hills, we had a place called the Lookout, and that's kind of what this would be. Okay. That... Well, I'm asking if the field of the watchers, the field of those that are observing can be meaning something of those that are, are observing what's transpiring with Balak and Balaam and also with the children of Israel. So that you're getting this, this kind of overarching view of what's going on. Is that possible? Hmm. It's possible. I mean, you could also, one translation says, uh, so Balak led Balaam to the Watchman Hills. Okay. Um, what, I'm, what I'm looking at is, here is, here's Balak. First he comes and brings Balaam to a point where they're able to see all of the children of Israel in their camps, right? Yeah. Now he's taking them where you can only see the hinder part, the least amount, the backside of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. So the first one is kind of like a calzone vision. The second is more like the Marais. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's interesting. The Bishop's Bible, you know, that precedes the King James, um, it says, and he brought him into a field where men might see far off, even to the top of a an hill, and built seven altars. Um, so, I mean, here, obviously, the, the idea is that they're, they're looking up over these the, the tribe of Israel on the, uh, we would say the hinder part, right? So they're right. just seeing some of it. Um, and uh, so we got the watchers there, but the ones watching are, are Balak and Balaam. But this would fit in with the idea that this is prophecy that's being symbolized. Right. You know, so the idea that we're having uh, for anybody who wasn't here yesterday, is that we're not symbolizing directly um, like the United States or anything like that, but it's more prophecies that relate to the United States or to Islam or to this movement or to the Adventist church, depending on which application we're making. And um, so this sort of direct um, just saying Balaam represents this or whatever 
is is not how we're going to approach this and that these and and this would also show us that this then these oracles which are prophecies are actually giving us a view of the history of Israel and and Ellen White's quite clear that that's what Balaam sees in his first oracle is he's shown the history of Israel Okay. That fit in what, with what we said yesterday? I think it fits well. So all of these parables, all of these oracles, we are looking on as being prophetic. So would we then apply these prophecies to specific events or specific periods okay so that's the question are each of these oracles marking an event or a way mark right okay. that's what right or are they, uh illustrating the same thing but in a different detail so are they line upon line or are they all part of the same line like different way marks in the same line is that what you're asking correct I'm seeing them all as, as separate portions of different lines. Right. So like uh, the first angel's message, second angel's message, third angel's message, and then the fourth. Correct. Yeah, which makes sense. Now, of course, each of them can uh, be zoomed in onto a, a, line, a waymark and themselves be a line. Agreed. So we, so we already know that. But the question is, how are we primarily seeing this? And I think that would make the most sense to see them as the three one combination of a line. Okay. And he said unto Balak, stand here by thy burnt offering while I meet the, the Lord yonder. And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, go again unto Balak and say thus so balaam is telling balak remain with the burnt offering i'm going to go over here to meet with the lord i'm going to talk with the lord without you in attendance i'm going to separate myself from you to receive this word from God. Why is he doing this? You're asking why is Balaam seeking a word from God? Why is he separating himself from Balak in order to, to receive the word from God? I don't know. I mean, wouldn't that just be how he does it? I mean, he's just going to spend some time with God and then come back with what God says. I don't know. I don't know enough about exactly his methodology of you know, how he does his work, why he does that. Okay idea of what that would mean i'm just i'm asking a question for us to consider okay i, I can't see that it's significant I and mean, it just seems to be that that's what he does so, so this is something insignificant in the bible well no not insignificant in the sense of i mean i don't think it represents a symbol in that, you know, he did that in all the other times, like when they called him, he had to spend some time with God um, uh, before he came back with an answer. And he's doing the same thing here with these, though um, there are some differences as we go through the oracles, at least on what they tell us. Right. Because in his, I mean, it doesn't tell us that in the final oracle. I mean, it just seems like he speaks, um, but but we haven't got there yet. So, 
so I don't know if it represents a symbol, the fact that he leaves. It, I mean, it would just be what, what, what he does. He, he well, when the emissaries were sent to him, he requested that they tarry the night. Right. Here, he's not taking a night. No. He's just going off away from Balaam, away from the princes. Or excuse me, Balak, not Balaam. Yeah. He's going off away from Balak and the princes and saying, I will meet with the Lord over here. Mm -hmm. So then we have, and the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, go again unto Balak and say thus. Now, we've established directly that Balaam had been a prophet and is now a false prophet. Yeah, he apostatized. Correct. He chose greed over everything else. Now, and when he came to him, when Balaam came to Balak, behold, he stood by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab with him. <clears throat> so when Balaam came to Balak, Balak stood by his burnt offering and the princes of Moab stood with Balak. Yeah. And Balak said unto him, what hath the Lord spoken? Now, we've already established the point when we were addressing this yesterday that Balak and his princes were idolaters. Mm -hmm. So, having to consider the words of a god that was not of their pantheon of their worship mm -hmm. would have been a strange situation for Balak well my understanding in the the near middle and near east right in the historic the ancient near east um is that they considered God sort of to be local and to be for each um, each nation, each people. Now, they could have tried to uh, just use their God to fight against Israel, but they've noted that the, no other gods have been able to stand against the God of Israel. So... To me, the idea would be that they're trying to get the God of Israel to turn against Israel. And they believe that uh, a prophet like uh, ba Balaam has that power to, to invoke this God's name to curse someone. Um, that I think that's the whole idea of what they're doing. That's why they're getting Balak. And, and why, because he's a prophet of Yahweh, the Lord, and they know that's the same God that is being, uh, is leading the Israelites in the, in the wilderness. So that's, that's the way that I understand it, of what he's, what, what Balak is doing in getting Balaam. So to me, it doesn't seem odd at all. It seems like what you would do if your gods have failed you and you you want this people to be cursed. Okay. Balak had confidently expected a curse that would fall like a withering blight upon Israel. And the words of the prophet filled him with surprise and with horror. He passionately exclaimed, What hast thou done to me? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. 
Balaam endeavored to make a virtue of necessity and professed to have spoken from a conscientious regard for the will of God, the words which had been forced from his lips by divine power. His answer was, must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? Balak could not even now relinquish the hope of securing the destruction of Israel. He decided that the imposing spectacle presented by the vast encampment of the Hebrews, arranged in perfect order, each tribe around its own standard, and the tabernacle of God among them, had so intimidated Balaam that he dared not practice his divinations against them. The king hoped that a change of place might affect something in his favor. He would take the prophet to some point where only a small part of the host of Israel might be seen. And if he could get there, if he could there get Balaam to curse them in detached parties, the whole camp might soon be devoted to destruction. In all this, Balaam se Balak seems to have had perfect confidence that Balaam's enchantments could paralyze the strength of Israel and bring confusion and defeat upon their enemies. Balaam was now conducted to the top of an elevation called Pisgah, where another trial was to be made. He had not given up all hope of the reward and he was willing to do all in his power to carry out the purposes of the king. On this height were erected, as before, seven altars, whereon were placed the same offerings as the first. The king and his princes were again left by the sacrifices, while Balaam retired to meet with God. Again, the prophet was entrusted with a divine message, which he was powerless to alter or withhold. When he appeared to the anxious expected company, the eager question was put to him, what hath the Lord spoken? The answer as before struck terror to the heart of the king and the princes. Now this answer is what we're about to read. And he took up his parable and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? What is Balaam being, being led to say here? Is he not saying that we can trust the word of God? Mm -hmm. The prophecy is sure. Okay. <clears throat> now, now, in the context, you know, of, of how we look at July 18th, I mean, this to me was the real problem with um, those that rejected July 18th after the failed prediction. So obviously they did not believe this. Or they said, well, God wasn't leading us. Right, so there was sort of a, there was mixed views. Some felt, though they didn't really express it this way, but somehow that we, we, um, uh, because what Jeff said, so I'll put it this way. Um, Jeff said, if July 18th doesn't happen, the one responsible is God, basically, in that everything that he has showed us and led us to points to July 18th. He didn't say, if July 18th fails, then we have failed in our understanding of prophecy, or that God was not leading us, right? Jeff never took that position. Yet those are the positions that others had. Either God was not leading us, 
at all in that, or we failed, which you know is 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 a different thing completely. Even though on on the one hand you could you could say that the two could happen together, but we had put this movement was of God, and so if you take the position that that God, the movement was of God. Um, you would have to you would have to either accuse God or accuse us. So either God failed us, he didn't lead us, as he had been leading us, and, and that blame would then be put upon God, not upon us. Or you choose some in the movement who misled the movement, and you know, we we were wrong in that we we were self-deceived. Does that make sense? How those? I think, two... well, your your comment is logical. Okay, so now here in this second oracle, and and we haven't placed this where where we would put it on the line, but the thing is, this is about the assurance <coughs> that God will do as He promised. Right. And this is not a time will tell sort of. Um, a, 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 a sort of idea. It can't be a time will tell concept. Right. And that's the thing to me that bothers me about the movement is that we're sort of, well, we're going to make some predictions and if if we're right, you know, we'll be shown to be right. And if we're wrong, we'll be shown to be wrong. But that can't be. It's not, it's not, it's not the approach that we should have with prophecy. The issue that that I heard brought up quite a bit, both before and after July 18th, it's fairly simple. Mm -hmm. There are those that were very adamant that this was a message hung upon time. Overlooking the fact that Elder Jeff did not initially give this warning, that this was a repeat of a warning that had been given by Ellen White. Mm-hmm. The more that Elder Jeff was being attacked about the Nash, the prophecy of the destruction of Nashville, the more Ellen White was being attacked as well as being a false prophet. Yeah. Now, we have choices to make. Each of us have a choice on a daily basis. Is Ellen White accepted as being a prophet of God? Are we willing to prove for ourselves and for those around us on a day-by-day -day basis that Ellen White is and was a prophet of God? Okay, and I think this is, is the crux of the matter. So one of the things about, like, right after July 18th, so July 19th, um, I, I presented that there are two options. We were right as to the time, as wrong as to the event, or wrong as to the time, but right as to the event. And some people wanted to say, well, we were wrong as to the time. Um. And it's just we need another time. But that would parallel us with those in 1840 that just said we got the wrong date. But one thing about that, that history of the midnight cry that makes us Seventh-day Adventists is that we accepted that the Lord had led us to that prediction, to the date October 22nd, 1844. Now, Adventism is moving away from that. That is, they're taking the side of those that opposed Adventism. 
They're saying we were wrong as to the time, but we are right as to the event. Right? That's that's Adventism today. I would agree. Yeah. They'll say, well, you know, we had some wrong dates and things like that, but the important thing is we learned about the sanctuary, um, you know, that, that God is being judged. This is their words. And um, that we need to rest one day in seven. So that's a, that's a direct quote. That's what Adventism has brought to the table to the Protestant and evangelical world, which, of course, is a far cry from what the truth is. Right? This isn't about God being judged, and this isn't about just resting one day in seven. So, I mean, that would just put us on the side of the first-day Adventists. Right. To a large degree. So, but the point is then, when, when, when we look at, if we reject July 18th, and we use the excuses that were used um, to reject it, this would be the same excuses that were used to ge- reject October 22, 1844, after the Great Disappointment. Great. And, and of course, those are the same excuses, the same sort of argument could be brought to the resurrection itself. You know, it's just a face-saving device. And so what really stands here, uh, to me, what this movement has been about, to me, is Adventism true or not? Was it laid upon a solid foundation or not? Has God led Adventism or not? Are we just some misguided church that has just been um, modifying, you know, as we've gone along, we've just been making excuses for all the failures that we've had. I mean, to me, it's pretty clear that this movement is about Adventism and and Adventism stands or falls based upon the light that has been given to this movement, because this light isn't anything other than the advancing light of the midnight cry. And if you reject this light, you will logically have to reject Adventism. And if you logically reject Adventism, then you have to logically reject Christianity. And there's no foundation whatsoever. Once you understand what this movement is about. So here, this second one, God is not a man that he should lie. So God doesn't lie. And he also does not repent. He's not going to turn from his purposes he's going to accomplish that which he said he will do now the problem that we have is that we are on a path and and this this is the important part of understanding how god leads he leads step by step he gives us light for our feet and what i see my perspective is that many people have not followed the light that God has given us. They're not even looking at it. And they're they're wanting this movement to be true. So they're so they're saying that they believe in July 18th and they believe in the Trump prediction, but they're not following the light so that we can understand what all of this means. The typical nature of this movement All of the things that God has shown us all the way through to me are very, very clear that this movement is typical, that it is prophetic, that everything that we do, we're a part of, we're a part of prophecy. And what I see is the parts of prophecy that we played are now being ignored. In 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 this uh, pretense of actually accepting that these prophecies are true. And isn't that what happened with the Millerite movement? Yeah. Yeah, they said, oh, Miller is right. We just got the wrong date. It's it's gonna be 1845 or it's gonna be 1849. However, they kept changing it or 1850, it's gonna be, or 51. It's gonna be seven years after October 22nd, 1844. Because that 
that day of atonement is going to be just seven years long or whatever. But however it was done, it was, um, it was done and partly as a rejection of the light that God had given us. Not as a recognition that God was leading us step by step and that the increase of light, as Ellen White says, new light establishes and makes clear old light. It doesn't contradict it. It doesn't do it away. It doesn't say that this prophecy now needs to be interpreted differently because we were wrong about our interpretation. What I see in Adventism is, is this consistency with Millerite understanding where other churches who come out of the Millerite movement reject that God was leading in the seventh month movement. And so I think the same applies today. So would the premise be that the seventh month movement and July 18th symbolically line up? Yeah, that's that's the idea, because the seventh month movement is Samuel Snow. And and his mother's right. I mean, his last letter published July 18th. So obviously it has to be typifying July 18th. So those that set aside the July 18th movement, much as those set aside the seventh month movement, mm -hmm. would then not be prepared to receive or to give the third angel's message. That's, that's the point, yes. It's kind of a fearsome point. Mm -hmm. And how to make people see it and to see what they're doing, that's the thing that I have no answer to other than what we're doing now. Okay. Could we say then that those that reject July 18th, those that reject the seventh month movement are also rejecting the Son of God? Well, yeah. Now, just, just another point. So, so we yeah. have, was July 18th. Um, do we understand fully how the Trump prediction is tied to July 18th? That is how Jeff connected what was happening with the 45th president, how he was tying it to July 18th, and how that showed up prophetically in our movement, and why it was so difficult for the movement when Trump was not reelected. And then once we, once we looked at January 6th and so forth, uh, we should have been, been able to see that this was all part of the purpose of July 18th and the 45th president understanding that had presented. And I don't know if we've made that really clear how these two are tied together. I don't think it has been made very clear. Now, the only thing I can say is when, when we're looking at, um, and Stephen did it in his presentation on Sabbath, where he went through the comparison of Xerxes and Trump dealing with the, the years of their reign, right? And do, do you remember that? The, and the, uh, the period of time there, whatever. Um, you have to open this up. Let's see if I can find it here. Um, So it's in his Order Out of Chaos presentation. Um, okay, so that had to do with like Xerxes' ascension year, uh, Xerxes' first year, Xerxes' second year, Xerxes' third year and the 180 days and then the seven days and how we applied that remember that why don't you cover it again 
Okay, uh, I'll just share my screen here. Okay. So this is just uh, Stephen's PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, I'll make it a bit bigger. So Trump has an accession year. Now, um, he's, this is how Stephen lines it up. So he's going to take January 20th, 2017 as the accession year. And then he's going to have the first year of Xerxes, right? So he's going to line those up with Trump's. Now, Trump is 70 years, seven months, and seven days, inclusive count of days. Uh, when he's inaugurated, right? And then we're going to have this third year, and that third year is going to be January 2020, uh, January 20, 2020, to July 18, 2020, which is a period of 180 days as Xerxes' third year. And it's in Xerxes' third year where he has the 180-day feast starting on the first day of the first month, and then at the end of that, he's going to have these seven days, which are going to be uh, this, the Akitu festival in the fall. And on the seventh day, which happens to be a Sabbath and the Day of Atonement, he's then going to ask for, ask for Vashti to come out um, and reveal herself to his drinking buddies, right? Right. So, so July 18th lines up with this. This is how we, we, we look at this. Okay, so that's, so we can see here that Trump is tied up with July 18th, at least in this way, though there's more to it. Um, now, Stephen suggests, well, that uh, seven days could be seven years going to 2027, but he just sort of dropped that hint um, and it could be, um, we don't know. But we also have other things tied up with July 18th. One is we have the 252 days between July 18th and November 9th, right? And those can be divided up basically with um, uh, Enoch and uh, Methuselah. Um, is it um, dealing with... Um, the 65 years and the 187 years, right? Okay. Right, so that 252 days can be divided into um, 187 days and um, um, 65 days. So the 252 days can be divided. So those are just some things chronologically, but there's even more thematically and, and also more chronology as well. So the point that I'm making is that um, when we dealt with Trump and we dealt with all of these different things, the pandemic, right, all of the different pans, the Battle of Panium, Jeff had tied that up with these symbols from midnight to the midnight cry. And we looked at midnight as being November 9th, 2019, and the midnight cry as being July 18, 2020. That is, it is Panium. And we have this pandemic, as Odilio shows, that occurs between these two periods of time uh, and, and specifically even connects to um, the end of our, our line of that 777 days, right? So you have the 780 days, and 781 days, all these different symbols, right? Everybody's with that, I hope. So then if we have this pandemic under Trump, have we not had the Sunday law, the type of the Sunday law, under the 45th president? And hasn't it served its purpose as a type? And, and if it served its purpose as a type, is Trump typifying himself? That is, is Trump going to come back into power and, and execute a Sunday law? Does that even make sense? See, that, that's the thing that I've had the most trouble with. Okay. Yeah, Trump cannot typify himself. He has to typify something else. And, 
and so he's, his history, the history of the pandemic, is typifying the Sunday law. Now, now Trump is part of that, and so is Biden, right? Because Biden's going to be the president in 2021 when our line ends. And and then we have January 6th, which is going to be, um, you know, even earlier. You have January 6th is the end of the United States. And so you have here even symbolized this whole battle that's being talked about that Xerxes is going to have against Greece that he's planning here. Well, wouldn't the planning be a typification of the event itself? Isn't a, isn't a blueprint a typification of a building? It can be. Right. And that history that Trump is, uh, that Xerxes is going through in, in, in this story of the 187 days, planning this battle against Greece, which he's going to lose, Trump is going to typify that in this history, right? He's going to go through the same thing. And remember, Xerxes' line, this, this story of Xerxes and the connection that's going to follow after with the story of Esther are typifications of the Sunday law. So we can see that we can't, we can't ignore July 18th and what we see here in the story of Xerxes. And, and we have to tie Trump to that history, but we can't put Trump then as Alexander the Great. And we can't look at Trump to once again become the president of the United States and enact a Sunday law because he can't be typifying himself. So yes, you cannot have one prophetic event turn back upon itself in order to make the event valid. Right. It's already valid. Right. And, and, and it, to me, it's a denial of its validity to say in order for it to be valid, Trump has to become president again. But what it's what it's also doing is it's in a in a tacit manner it's saying that ellen white was not a prophet yes there's no doubt about that but that's what it's doing so the problem that i've been having with this with the time will tell attitude is the fact that this is saying that ellen white has given a prophecy that is not of God, that was of her opinion, mm -hmm. and has invalidated her as a prophet. Now, I understand, in a sense, I understand um, Colin's intent. He's, he's kind of saying, well, I think it's going to happen. Um, um, but other people are taking that time, time will tell as... Well, you know, we're going to wait and see if it happens. And if it doesn't happen, well, we're just going to have to wait for some other event. We're going to have to do some other way to fulfill it. And that's the problem I have is that it's already been fulfilled. And we're not acknowledging um, that Jeff was correct. It's just his understanding of what that meant, which line he was in was, was, uh, was the problem. Anyway, you can share your screen again. So hopefully that helps a little bit. And, and of course, these 777, that's the point that I've been trying to make. The seven altars, the seven bullock, and the seven rams. Is we're going we're gonna to look at that uh, next week in some more detail. I'll have some charts drawn out with that. Um, this, to me, really ties this to this movement. But as you said, we can take the story of Balaam and apply it to the Adventist church as well. Right. And so I would think when we apply it to this movement, uh, we apply it to that structure that goes from December 21st, 2012 to December um, 25th, 2021. But when we apply it to the church, the 777 applies to 
the 777 days in 1989 to 1991, right? Right. And then to our final 777 in our line. So basically, we have two different lines of these 777 days. One that starts on November 9th, 1989, going to December 21st, 2021. And another one starting in December 21st, 2012, going to December 25th, 2021. And both of these lines are valid. And I think both of these are being illustrated by the story of Balaam's oracles. Okay. And, and, and what we can say about our 777 is it's a zoom into that final way mark of December 25th, 2021. And what that means for uh, this movement is also tied to the Adventist church. Now, there, there may be more to it that we don't see yet, but I think at least we can see that we're zooming into um, some history. And maybe we can even just say it's the history of Trump but uh, and the pandemic. But um, well, in, in, in a manner of looking at this. In my years past, I had to look and, and study a subject that's, that can be very dry called economics. Yeah. And we had to study both micro and macro economics. Now, in this situation that we have with the lines, in many ways, we have a macro line. We have a line, a line that has a, a viewpoint that is fairly broad. And then there are times with this, with these lines that we have to get into the micro portion, the, the greater detail, as you're saying, zooming in. Because when, we, when we're examining these lines extremely carefully and closely, we began to see some substantial detail that when we are zooming out can easily be missed. Uh -huh. So in this with Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good balaam here is saying you can trust the word of the lord you can trust the word of god to do exactly what he says he will do therefore with the nashville prediction you can trust the word of God through Ellen White, that destruction is soon to fall upon Nashville. That the warning of July 18th was entirely valid, just as the predictions regarding October 22nd, 1844 were completely valid. Behold, I have received commandment to bless. And he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Now, what is this added word of commandment? Why do they add it? Yes. Um, well, just to make it make a bit more sense. Um, So it's an added word. It is not a Hebrew word, right? There's no Hebrew word there, no. Okay. But the word that follows, we, or the word that precedes received, laka, mm -hmm. and then to bless is barak. Yeah, barak, yeah. So where he has 
I have received to bless mm -hmm. and he hath blessed. Is that a doubling? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're in two different forms because one is I have received, so that's reflective and um, the first person singular. Right. And then he hath blessed. Um, that's uh, the third person. So it's a different third person past. Yeah, well, completed. Um, yeah, so here you got uh, Barak. So that's just in Hebrew, just says, uh, um, basically it says, behold, blessed, um, uh, and, and, and then you actually have the first person, person in the word take, I have taken. So I've taken blessing. Basically that is, I've taken to bless. So it has uh, a Lamech in the front. So basically, translate this literally. Uh, Behold, I have taken to bless, and um, and blessed. Right. So that's literally how you would translate it. Okay. Um, it doesn't even really have. Uh, let me see here. Um, well, so that's the way that. I would translate it. Um, I'm just going to look here. Um, let's see what this one shows. Yeah, so it's it's actually in the the infinitive absolute to bless. I but then the word um, uh, it's the first person singular right so to bless to bless uh has been uh i have taken or it's taken to me to bless and then it has uh the third per uh third person masculine singular is that word so that would be and he blessed um and then the word is uh low which means no not nothing and um and then you have that word shuv okay. so he will not turn back from that he will not reverse it right so that that's the word shuv and it's written in in uh, the hifal form which means um uh, has to do with its um um he he can't turn it back. He can't reverse it, and then it's yeah. So it's uh, anyway singular. So God cannot reverse what He has blessed, but it's been given to Him to bless. That is, Balaam has been given this to bless, so He has blessed Israel, but God can't turn back that blessing because He is blessed, right? God has blessed them and will not repent right that's that's what it's saying i know it's just kind of digging into it a little bit more but the idea here is that it was given to balaam to bless them but actually god is the one that has blessed not balaam right that's why they have i have received commandment to bless that's why they put that in there because um this is something that was been given to him god has blessed and god cannot reverse it so balaam is is correct here this was not him blessing israel this is god blessing israel and god is not going to change okay he hath not beheld iniquity in jacob Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. That's interesting. We know Jacob's story. We know his history. 
yet this is being presented prophetically. Mm -hmm. Now the translators, as, as they went through these, <clears throat> give us reference back to Romans. So you have Romans 4, 7 and 8, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. This goes right back to Jacob's struggle with the angel. Jacob refused to take his eye off of God. He sought the blessing. He held on to that blessing throughout the entire struggle. We also have Exodus 13, 21 and into Exodus 29 and 33. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of, of a cloud to lead them the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and by night along with. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. That they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. That I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. And then finally, and he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Then we came to this from Psalm 89, 15. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, O Lord, in the light of thy countenance. So is this from Numbers 23, 21, describing those within the movement that have faith in the word of God? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Numbers 23, 22. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Why would the translators give the, the equivocation of those that were brought out of Egypt as having the strength of a unicorn. How's that equivocation? The strength of a unicorn. Okay. Well, to me, equivocation is a logical fallacy where you uh, exchange definitions from one word with another. So I'm not sure what you're asking. How strong is the unicorn? Well, well, I mean, this would probably, there's, we're not sure what animal this is referring to. Some people think it's a, a rhinoceros. Okay. But um, there's other opinions regarding it. Okay. So we will continue because we're going to need to compare this line upon line. Mm -hmm. Now, again, here, Numbers 24, 8, in a chapter that we're soon to read, God brought him forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. Deuteronomy 33, 17. His glory is like the firstling of the bullock, of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. 
With them, he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim. And they are the thousands of Manasseh. So again, the ten thousands come up, which we started to address, but never have really finished. Then we have Job 39, 10, and 11. Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Wilt thou because his strength is great? Or wilt thou leave thy labor to him? Numbers 23, 23. A numeric doublet. Surely there is no enchantment in Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob, Jacob and of Israel, what hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. Here, Ellen White becomes very, very clear. In this prophecy, Balaam sets forth the unchangeable character of God. Men are fickle, unreliable, especially is this the case where their minds are not under the direction of the Holy Spirit. When men are controlled by the Prince of Darkness, no dependence can be placed upon their promises but God being infinite in wisdom and goodness, his purposes and decrees are immutable. It is stated in the scriptures that God repented that he had done so much for man when only in gratitude and disobedience were the return for all of his mercies. Here the Lord speaks after the manner of men that finite man might understand him. When God has pronounced judgments against the people, as he did against Nineveh, and like Nineveh, they believe the word of God, humble themselves before him, and turn from their evil ways, he revokes his sentence and gives the transgressors of his law another trial. But in all the history of God's dealings, it will be found that although he might bear along with the sinner, disobedience will surely meet its punishment. There are limits to the forbearance of God. There's a point at which it becomes necessary to interpose his vengeance and visibly to rebuke the impiety of men. And it is no less apparent that those who love and obey God's law will realize that he means what he says and that all his precious promises to the faithful and obedient will be fulfilled to the letter. The Lord solemnly announced that it was his purpose to bless Israel and that he would not sanction oppression or out rage against the posterity of Jacob, while they should comply with the conditions which he had given them, he would be faithful in the fulfillment of all of his promises. Balaam was made to understand the confidence and the strength of Israel. The shout of a king is among them. Christ, enshrined in the cloudy pillar, was in their midst, reigning over and protecting them and leading them forth to battle and to victory. Their recent conquests, while moving forward in the strength of God, had inspired them with hope and with courage. At the word of God, they were ready to, re to advance or retreat, to put on the armor or to lay it off with the same confident assurance of final victory. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, 
the strength of a unicorn. <coughs> the rhinoceros is one of the most powerful of animals and Balaam uses this creature as a figure to show how vain it is for any earthly power to array itself against the most high. God hath accomplished his will in bringing Israel from bondage and idolatry in Egypt, notwithstanding the opposition of Pharaoh and his hosts. It would be safer for lesser animals to attack the powerful unicorn, the rhinoceros, than for finer, finite man to seek to turn aside the purpose of the infinite one. So in other words, it would be safer for lesser animals to attack a rhinoceros than it is for us to set aside the understanding of July 18th, 2020. So in this, in this particular article, Ellen White identifies the unicorn as the rhinoceros. Mm -hmm. Should we continue to question that? No. Nope. No, and that's what I'm saying is the rhinoceros makes the most sense. Other people have different opinions, you know, different types of cattle or bulls or things like that. But um, I think the common accepted view is it's a rhinoceros. Okay. Not, not a unicorn is, you know, the mythological creature. Awed by these revelations of divine power, Balaam exclaimed, surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. Neither is there any divination against Israel. The great magician had tried his power of enchantment in accordance with the desire of the Moabites. But concerning this very occasion, it should be said of Israel, what hath God wrought? The fact would be recorded upon the pages of history that while Israel was under the divine protection, no people or nation though aided by all the power of Satan, should be able to prevail against them. All the world should wonder at the marvelous work of God in behalf of his people, that a man determined to pursue a sinful course should be so controlled by divine power as to utter. Instead of imprecations, the richest and the most precious promises in the language of sublime and impassioned poetry. <clears throat> what was happening here? Here was a man that had been a prophet, a man that had been a prophet and had apostatized. Yet he seeks a reward for which it, he is not due. He seeks to curse a people. And God says, no, you're not going to be able to do that. You've come to meet me. All you can do is speak the words that I will put in your mouth. Please. Go ahead. Just, just a thought here. Um, now, of course, this is recorded in, in Numbers um, 23 to 24, that you have the story of Balaam. Mm -hmm. Now, are the Israelites aware that this is happening? No. Yet Moses writes of it, so he knows of it. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Because when, when we compare this, because the chapter that follows these, the 25th chapter, where we are made aware 
that Moses was not fully cognizant of what was happening within his camp. Yet here he is, he is aware of what's going on with Balaam. Mm -hmm. Well, he may not have been aware of it at the time. It might have been revealed to him. This is not that far from the time before he dies. Yeah, I know. That's what's shocking to me. Yeah, so it had to have been shown him during the rebellion of Baal Peor, what was behind it. Okay. That's the only thing I can think. So... Now, are there other questions or comments here? Okay. The favor of God at this time manifested toward Israel was to be an assurance of his protecting care for his obedient, faithful children in all ages. When Satan should inspire evil men to annoy, to misrepresent, to harass, and to destroy God's people, this very occurrence would be brought to their remembrance and would strengthen their courage and their faith in God. The future success of Israel and the doom of their enemies is further set forth in the words the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. Surely this message should have been a sufficient warning to both Balaam and the king of Moab to mistake no further attempt to injure the people so signally protected by divine, by infinite power. Yet Balaam and Balak both sought to set aside the protection of God, thinking that Balaam would be able to give some kind of a curse. And Balak said unto Balaam, neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. And Balaam answered and said unto Balak, told not I thee, saying, all that the Lord speaketh, that I must do. And Balak said unto Balaam, come, I pray thee, I will bring thee unto another place. Peradventure, it will please God that thou mayest curse me them from thence. And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor that looked toward Jeshimon. And Balak said unto Balak, or Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars and prepare me here seven bullocks and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. Now, what was so important about bullock and ram? Why three times are they now building seven altars and giving the same offering on each altar? I mean, well, these are sanctuary offerings. Sanctuary. Agreed. Though, um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, this was given to the Israelites um, sometime before, but Balaam would have known, he, he has some acquaintance with what the offerings of the Israelites are, even prior to, I guess, um, uh, you know, just from the practice of the people around him who are worshiping God. But could 
yeah, yeah, yeah. anybody of the children of Israel make an offering of either a bullock or a ram? Well, you'd have to be a priest. Okay, could anyone from the children of Israel bring a bullock to be their offering? Could just anyone do it? No. Who was it in in the offering tableau in the in the offering list? Who was it that normally would bring a bullock or a ram as an offering? Um, well, I know the high priest did on the Day of Atonement, but that's a special case. Yeah. So. Um, So, I mean, priests can bring bullocks, so I can't see that anyone else can. Yeah, it looks like only a priest that's anointed shall bring the bullock's blood. Yeah, so it's only a priest. Do you have any other answer to that? Well, I'm looking at it that it would, it would either be a priest or a king. Um, so you're saying like in Leviticus where it talks about the king's offering? Right. I don't see that anywhere. I'm saying that the poorest of the children of Israel could not bring a bullock or a ram. Right, but I, I think only the priests could. I mean, obviously, a king could provide bullocks for offerings, uh, but priests would do the offering. I'm I'm asking really the question. Um, in this situation, if this wasn't a very expensive offering seen as being the best of the best yeah yeah okay now the comment that was made from the chat jeshimon solitude or desolate it's a good comment great observation so balak brought balaam to the top of peor that looketh toward jeshimon which is the wilderness. Okay. Now, they are again offering a bullock and a ram on every altar. Mrs. White mm -hmm. comments. The king of Moab was disheartened and distressed at the second failure of his efforts to secure a curse upon Israel. In the anguish of his soul, he exclaimed, neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. Yet a faint hope still lingered in his heart, and he determined to make another trial. He now conducted Balaam to Mount Peor. Where was the temple noted most of all for the disgusting scenes of licentiousness there enacted in honor of their God? Here the same number of altars were erected as before, and the same number of sacrifices were offered. But Balaam went not alone at, as at other times to learn God's will. He made no pretense of sorcery, but standing by the altars, he looked around upon the widely spread tents of Israel. Again, the Spirit of God rested upon him, and the divine message came from his lips 
in the same poetic language as before. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. As the valleys are they spread forth as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of line aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as the cedar trees beside the waters, he shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesses thee, and cursed is he that curses thee. The prosperity of God's chosen people is here represented by some of the most beautiful figures to be found in nature. The prophet likens Israel to fertile valleys covered with abundant harvests, to flourishing gardens watered by never failing springs, to the fragrant sandal tree and the stately cedar. The figure last mentioned is one of the most strikingly beautiful and appropriate to be found in the inspired word. The cedar of Lebanon has been has the most honorable position among the trees of the Bible. It was regarded with reverence by all the people of the Holy Land. The class of trees to which it belongs is found wherever man has gone in all of the earth. It flourishes in the heat, yet defies the cold. It grows luxuriantly beside the rivers and the fountains of waters and yet thrives upon the sandy waste. It plants its roots deeper among the rocks of the mountain and boldly stands in, defi in defiance of the tempest. Its leaves are bright and green when all else has perished at the breath of winter. The wind playing upon its foliage calls forth a strain of soft, sad music and a flood of perfume that fills the air with its spicy fragrance. The divine hand has exalted the cedar as king over the forest. It is called the tree of the Lord and is named among the most precious and beautiful of God's works on the earth. So great was its value that even in ancient times, only kings and princes could dwell in houses of cedar. So we have Balaam here giving a parable, but giving a prophecy regarding the children of God and those that will follow and not doubt his word. What should this say to us today? How should we accept this today? I think we have, we have quite a bit to consider as we prepare for what we're going to start in on Sunday. Now, do we have any other comments or questions, seeing that our time is almost up? I mean, I've been enjoying the conversation, but this has been a very quiet group today. Yeah. Hmm. I'm just thinking about the, the question, but... Um... Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? <clears throat> Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together 
to study, to consider, and to wrestle with your word. Direct us today in all that is to be done. Be with us so that those things that are done may give glory to you, give glory to your character, give glory to your word. Help us now, Father. In everything that we consider, may our focus be upon you so that we may truly remain upon the path that you would set before us. For this, Father, we thank you. In this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.